This evening, I would like to explore the Diamond Sutra. I first got involved in the Diamond Sutra with Alan Watts back in the early 50s. And I would say that I return to it periodically, but it reached a high point in my work with Myobang Sunim. Myobang is a truly great Buddhist monk. He's a Roshi from the Changyed order, Korean Buddhist. And we had many interactions together. And for whatever this talk is worth, he would enjoy it. So let me just jump into this greatest of all Buddhist sutras, the Diamond Sutra. To grasp the idea of the Diamond Sutra, let me say a few words first. You have to understand the Bodhisattva vow. And this is it. All beings must I lead to nirvana, into that realm of nirvana that leaves nothing behind. I mean, it's complete. There's nothing else to do. It's final. It's complete. There are many kinds of enlightenment experiences. The kind of enlightenment experience of the Diamond Sutra, however, since it leaves nothing behind, means it is total. It is what it is. And all the others must bring along something with it that makes it something yet to be done. Now, the Bodhisattva vow, I would like to say a few words about the term. Bodhi is mind, sometimes translated as enlightened mind. Sattva is the Sanskrit for essence. So it's the essence or the being in the Greek sense. It's the very essence of enlightenment. So therefore, the enlightened mind, the essence of enlightenment or the essence of the enlightened mind, that's the bodhisattva. Now, what's interesting about the Diamond Sutra is that if you grasp one idea, then you can get into it most directly. Now, in any system that you're in, you start with some kind of premise. Behind the premise, invariably, there is some uh, model. Uh, behind the premise, there's some model, and behind the metaphor, if you go into abstract thought, invariably, there's a metaphor. Now, with these three things, you can play. That's what you need. You need to grasp the premise, the basic assumptions of a system. Take that basic assumption of a system, that's its jumping off point, that's its premises. Look for Look for the idea that suggests it. That's the model. Every model presupposes a metaphor. And any kind of reflection, therefore, if you want to understand a system, you identify that basic assumption and you then explore it in terms of the model. So therefore, you have a set of terms that you consider to be significant for any system to have. Oh, God, uh, enlightenment, 
wisdom, oh, ignorance, soul, self. Ah, you can add a bunch of them. There are many. And what you do with a set of terms is that you want to see whether or not you can express those terms within that basic assumption that you have and the model. And therefore, you kind of spin them off. And the model, therefore, we can talk about various kinds of models. And uh, there's a very fine book by the uh, Stephen Pepper who wrote a book on what he calls the studies in evidence, root metaphors. And there are only four basic models. There are only four basic models in philosophy. There are only seven colors, you know, only seven notes. Only three basic colors, primary colors, of course. So that once you get used to the idea that you're only dealing with the way in which these four models function, then the, all the different permutations of those and the various combinations in which they may co coincide and touch one another generates different systems of thought. Then when you want to express it, you go to the level of the metaphor, and then you have an interesting way of communicating whatever content you have. Now, when we go into Buddhism and this system, which is the Diamond Sutra. It's a Diamond Sutra that's supposed to do away with all doubts. Well, it's very interesting. You see the essence of enlightenment, which is what the Bodhisattva is. That's what the name suggests. What is the essence of enlightenment? The essence Bodhi, mind, enlightened, and truly enlightened, the essence of someone totally enlightened, pure, purely enlightened. That's its basic assumption that there is such a thing. But look here, watch this. What's the basic assumption I just said? That there is some mind that is in the highest sense, in the most profound sense, truly enlightened. And when you talk about it being truly enlightened, what you mean by truly is the very essence of a truly enlightened mind. That's what you mean by it, truly. The very essence of it. Look what that's saying, though, you see? That's saying there is such a thing as this, mind, a some mind, not all, some mind. So therefore, they suggest there may be other minds around here. And all you're talking about is this one, is some mind that is enlightened At its very essence, therefore, there's something about it which is essential to it, most essential to it. Now, the word essence, as different from being, right? essence is that fundamental aspect of the nature of reality which turns upon itself. It's that part of man which allows man to reflect upon himself. It's that part of mind which reflects upon itself. It's that part of mind which is consciousness has that capacity to, oh, oh, who did that? See, that's essence. Well, look what I have here now. Enlightened, see the metaphor, light. Oh, if I want to talk about then that, then therefore I can talk about, right? I can talk about the mind and I can talk about the radiance of the mind because I've already got that built into the word enlightened. Oh, I have in, or a kind of inward kind of enlightenment, so I want to use that as a metaphor. And uh, I want to separate it out from these others. Therefore, there's a many 
there's a many minds and there's one we're talking about see what I've done I've taken a statement and I'm looking at what's behind it I'm creating a, a model I'm pulling out a metaphor it's a metaphor candle light that's a metaphor and now I can talk about that statement in terms of my metaphor. Now I can say, you know, the other minds, however they may vary to and fro, some are brighter than others. See, I can do that because I have the candle image. See, I have that candle image. I can say, and some are more luminous, some sparkle. See, I can add to that. So I can now talk about these different minds in terms of the basic metaphor I have. And therefore, I can generate it. And I can say, look here. God, God is the greatest candle. He's the source of all light. Wisdom is to know that light which runs through all things. Oh, the self. Oh, the self, the soul. The soul can be enlightened. And uh, uh, the soul is what it is that experiences. So I can now take these terms that I have, and now I can talk about those terms in terms of my model. Now I can take another one. We'll do the same thing. But what are we doing? We're saying that if you take a basic assumption of the system, you can then get behind the language, treat it literally. You'll see there's a model there that suggests a metaphor. Uh, ignorance. Oh, there are some, some minds that are so feeble that they can hardly maintain the light of the light to illuminate their own existence. They're so feeble and light. See, I can now talk about it, and I can now express it, and I can bring in all kinds of variations. Can I? It follows from this metaphor. That's how I use it. Now, let's look at this now. Now that we've introduced the subject, this one, all beings, well, that suggests a whole bunch of them, doesn't it? A manyness again. Must I lead to nirvana? There must be a place called nirvana. Ah, we'll have to lead going up. Up is always a good model, right? Up, nirvana, right? And I must leave. So therefore, this one, uh, this one is going to be a very interesting. Uh, uh, being because it's going to, uh, let's give it a hat, right? There's a big hat, right? And it's going to lead, right? It's going to lead. Ah, whoopee, it's going to lead. There it goes, right? And all of these are going to chase after it. See, dee, 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 right? There they go. Leave your Nirvana. And into that realm of Nirvana, that leaves nothing behind. So it has to be complete, total. Nothing left. I can take the word lead. What kinds of things lead? Dogs lead. Scouts lead. Seeing eye dogs lead. I'm searching for a metaphor to deal with this term. If I identify it then, I can use that to color my model. This is my model. And that's how you think. That's how metaphysics emerges. Then you go back here and use these terms, and you generate a system. That's all. That's the way you generate a system. Now, in the Diamond Sutra, that is quite famous for many reasons. One is the great sutra called the uh, Platform Sutra. <clears throat> the uh, Platform Sutra is sometimes called as the, uh, uh, one of the tr truly great sutras. And when this Diamond Sutra was once recited, uh, Wei Yang, who is the hero of the Diamond Sutra, I mean is the hero of uh, the Platform Sutra, as it's sometimes called, when he heard it and he focused on it, he got instant enlightenment, that's all he needed 
and therefore he started the whole tradition of Zen Buddhism. The whole Zen Buddhism school grew out of Wainang in the sixth century, seventh century, six sixty one A.D. Now, I'd like to, to um, just open you open up with this great quote. Right. Now, I'm using the Edward Conzi translation, which I admire very much. A man is a very fine thinker, and that went one of my place notes. Uh, the Lord asked, What do you think, Sabuti? Is there any Dharma which the Tathagata has fully known as the utmost, the right, and the perfect enlightenment? enlightenment? Is there any teaching, is there any Dharma which the Takthakata has demonstrated. Takthakata, by the way, is another name for the Buddha. It's the formal name of the Buddha. Okay, do it again. Is there any Dharma teaching which the Buddha, Takthakata, has fully known as the most perfect enlightenment? Is there any teaching which the Takthakata, the Buddha, has demonstrated? No. The Buddha says, no. Not as I understand what the Lord has said. And why? Why? This teaching which the Takthagata has fully known and, or demonstrated, it cannot be grasped, cannot be talked about. It is neither a dharma nor a no dharma. Why? Because the absolute exalts the holy persons is the answer to that. And there's a lot of translation difficulties, and there's a lot of scholars who mention that this is probably, this last sentence is somewhat suspect because of the way in which it's expressed. Uh, other translations include because an absolute is brought, brought forth the holy persons, because the absolute brought forth the holy persons, which is what I particularly care. Now look here, what is that saying? The Buddha, the Taktagata, brought forth no dharma, no wisdom, no special teaching, because it's the absolute that has brought forth holy persons. Now this dharma which the Takthakata has, has fully known, demonstrated, it can't be grasped, can't be talked about. Wait a minute now, look here. Oh. Can't be grasped. Huh? Can't talk about it. But it's fully known. Look here, it's fully known. And it's been demonstrated by the Buddha. But there's no teaching in it, no dharma, no teaching in it. There's no wisdom in it. He f fully realized it and demonstrated it. Can't put it in words, can't grasp it. That's the premise. That's the premise. <laughs> Therefore, our challenge is, can you pull a model out of that? See, so you can't, so look, let's try it. <clears throat> let's take pure, pure skepticism. Well, if there's no teaching and no wisdom, then nothing has been said and no claim is being made. No, no. Diamond Sutra wants to say there, it, there is, hey, this teaching is fully known. It has been demonstrated. Therefore, it's not nothing. All right? It's not nothing. It's not nihilism. That's nihilism. If you want to say there's no teaching, no wisdom, no nothing, that's nihilism. Right? That's nihilism. Right? It's nothing. Nothing matters, nothing is. No teaching, no wisdom, no nothing. Nihilism. No, no. In this Diamond Sutra, it's saying that the Buddha has fully known that this is true. 
that this is true. However, you can't put it, you can't talk about it, you can't put it into words, you can't grasp it. No. Can't be nihilism. Why? Well, the Buddha said, according to this sutra, uh, Buddha discovered it was fully, fully known, fully known. And why? Well, that's easy, because the absolute uh, brought forth holy persons. Let's, I want to take that for a moment. <clears throat> And in all fairness, I must tell you that that's not in the text. That's what, uh, in some study I did, the actual text is because an absolute exalts the holy persons. Right. Well, the absolute exalts holy persons, but the term itself, I believe, uh, when I was playing with it, can better be said to be brought forth, the absolute brought forth holy persons. Um, perhaps it isn't too much a difference between exalting holy persons, the absolute exalts holy persons, or brought forth, but uh, brought forth, though, suggests that there is a kinship, right? There's a generative model. And that's what accounts for holiness, where Buddha ex the absolute exalts holy persons. That suggests, again, some other dimension. Uh, as if the absolute exalts it, it means it must consider it so high that it considers it on a pedestal uh, significant so that it can be an exalted object. And for the absolute to consider holy persons as an object of exaltation is a rather curious statement. So I like that definition. Okay. Let me get a little bit more into this so you can enjoy it with me. Um, The bodhisattva, the great being, should produce an unsupported thought, a thought which is nowhere supported, a thought unsupported by sights, smells, taste, touch, or any of the senses, or mind objects. Okay, it's an unsupported thought. See, the bodhisattva is a great being, should produce unsupported thought. Should produce unsupported thought. Now, Unsupported, again, means has, has any reference through the senses or that is in any way attached to any object, including mind, right? contents of the mind. Therefore, if there is this bodhisattva that we described before as a totally enlightened being whose very essence is enlightenment, that person, right, that person, all right. All right. should produce unsupported thought. And that means then that what he is engaged in is going to have a kind of thought that is not in any way connected with the phenomenal universe. The world of appearances and all thoughts generated and that derive from it. There is no phenomenal aspect to his thought. 
It's unsupported. Well, if it's unsupported, then what kind of position is that person holding? What are they doing? Well, um, the Tathagata speaks in accordance with reality. Speaks the truth, speaks what is, not otherwise. The Tathagata does not speak falsely. But wait a minute. That goes against the idea now that it can be put into words. We said before that it couldn't be put into words. There's a problem here. Um, let's take a look at the way they resolve it. Um, this is the way they go. What is the truth about the nature of reality? That you can have an unsupported thought. Therefore, if there is this thing called the nature of reality, if in any way we can use thought, if we can use thought to characterize it, if we can use thought to indicate what is encountered, then there's something about the nature of reality which is capable of being expressed into words. That's all. But when? Suppose the whole thesis of the Diamond Sutra is to say that what we're going to call this can have no predicates whatsoever. Cannot have any predicates. <clears throat> if you can have no predicates, then you can't put it into words. Cannot, then you can't put it into words. Oh, look here, let's try one. All right. Is it possible the nature of, of reality in this high sense is pure consciousness? Hmm. But what do we've got with this word pure? What's that adding? Why not just consciousness? Okay, just consciousness. That saves one thought, doesn't it? Well, in order to be able to engage this according to the Diamond Sutra, you really have to be in a situation where this is directly known, see, fully known, fully known, must be fully known. Now, if it can be fully known and there are no predicates, then, then it's a question about whether or not when you're talking about being fully known, ah, we don't need fully, we'll just call it known, whether or not it can be an object of knowledge. Look here, in any discussion of knowledge, you have three things. The knower, right? the known, and the object of knowledge. And they're all different. There's a threesome here. Sometimes you just talk about these two, the knower and the known, and the object known. See, so you have a knower, you have the object known, and you have the process of knowing. They're often called three. You can now take these two, the, the thing known and the knower, and talk about it as something having a duality, a, a necessary pair. Or you can talk about all three and talk about it as a triune quality. So if you can know this, then there must be a you, a knower, that knows it, that's two, that's putting it into words. Well, then it's supported. It's not unsupported. Because we said that you can't use anything from the phenomenal world or objects of mind. And we just said, did we not? <laughs> 
these three or take it as a duality, that's objects of thought. Therefore, if this work means anything at all, then it, it can be, in some way, it can be, now we're going to change the word, it can be apprehended, but not known. So we'll get out of that, okay? It can be apprehended. And we can hope we get away with it. Hmm. If there's anything that consciously knows it, how many do you have? One, one. Yeah, no good. No, that's, right. that's out. So we're going to try to sneak around that and say, look here. In some way, this must be in some way apprehended. Uh-oh, apprehended, that still means there's something. The word, very word apprehend means to grasp, you know. It means to apprehend, to grasp. Well, there's one way I think we might be able to sneak through. Let's go back to this unsupported thought. Let us say now that we have the bodhisattva. <clears throat> He's, of course, pursuing it, bodhisattva. Would you not agree to have truly an unsupported thought means that you're not aware of any particular thought about anything that reflects anything in the phenomenal universe, smell, touch, any of the senses or objects of mind. So let us say, if it were possible, we could turn off each one of these things that occupy the mind's attention. If all of that could be turned off, including objects of the mind itself, including objects of the mind itself, what would that be? What would that be? That's the problem. What would that be? Okay, I want to now read a very nice line for you now, since I think we're ready to do it. What should we say of him who, after writing about it, about it, would learn it, bear it in mind, recite, study, and illuminate it for others. It's unthinkable, incomprehensible, is this discourse on the Dharma. You see, this Diamond Sutra is, is designed for the, the, the reader, right now me. Right. What should we say of him who, after writing about it or talking about it, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, after learning it, that's what I've done. Uh, bear it, I should bear it in mind. I should recite it. I should illuminate it in detail for others. And the next verse, sir. Right? It's unthinkable. It's incomprehensible as this discourse. Because it is not possible that this discourse or dharma could be heard by beings of inferior resolve, nor by uh, such as have a self-view of being a soul or a person. If you have the idea that when this is cleared, when this is cleared, that there is still a person, a person, a soul, a being there, then you're not able to make the next step. Because you know what? It's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible. 
Now, if you're following this, then you have an unsupported thought. That's an unsupported thought. Nor can beings who have not taken the pledge of Bodhi beings either hear this discourse on the Dharma or take it up, bear it in mind, or recite it, or study it. Right? So unless you see, well, let's try it now. Unless you see that, now that you grasp this idea, Now, wouldn't you agree that it might be interesting to talk to someone about this? An interesting notion. Right? You might talk about it. You might write about it. Oh, wait a minute. Now, look here. Do you think that might have an effect on people? Think it might have an effect on people? Look here. If you think it does, you know what you're doing? You're preparing people for that experience. Therefore, to that degree, to the degree that you grasp this teaching, whether you like it or not, you're becoming a what? A bodhisattva. I mean, it's just natural. <laughs> Look here. Since there's nothing to say about it, you don't have to worry about misspelling anything. <laughs> right? Right. Now, Look here. Look here. Um, the, the Diamond Sutra now goes in into the, the virtues, the, the, um, the merit one gains by teaching and spreading this, and it's countless, and it goes on, and they describe all kinds of merit that comes from this, and they go on and on and try to express it, so they build up a great image of how great it would be to have merit from everything possible anything you can possibly conceive in the universe. But in terms of teaching this and telling others about this, of course, it has only minor significance. And therefore, this is the greatest boon to mankind. What's the premise? The premise is that if you grasp this, you therefore see you don't, at a fundamental level, uh-oh, made a mistake. Right? I made a mistake. There. No boundaries. Ah. Oh, did he get that? Ah, unsupported thought. Wow, look here. Oh, look here. The whole assumption of this work is that this is an extremely important thing to talk about. But you know what? What can you say about it? Like, what can you say? Let's see, what's he, what he can say? I know, I know. Let's go back to role model. You can now bring in God. No. A soul, soul. No. Ignorance. No. What model is behind this? Nothing. <laughs> Isn't that a guess? Wait a minute. Every philosophical system has a model. There are only four basic models. Remember that stuff we were talking about? What happens with it now? It's not usable. And so this Diamond Sutra brings up this, and, and uh, it is really a very fine piece of work. And... Uh, uh, I'd like to just give you a, a couple of more quotes because it's uh, uh, whoever would say that the, the that the view of a self has been taught by the Buddha, the Tathagata, the view of a being, the view of a living soul, the view of a person. Uh, would he be right in speaking this? Sabuti replied, no. 
He wouldn't be speaking right. Why not? Here comes the quote. That which has been taught by the Tathagata, which is the title of the Buddha, as a view of the self, there's no view has been taught by the Tathagata. But you can call it a view of the self. See, but you can call it a view of the self. What's a view of the self? You talk about the view of the self. Well, there isn't any. That's a view of the self. I bet you can anticipate the next great line. Right? Is there a doctrine that the Buddha taught about the soul? Yeah, he talked about the soul as being no soul. That's his doctrine of the soul. See how easy it is? Right. All for one evening. Can you guys are just getting so much? Try the next one. Look here, try this one. The Lord then said uh, to Sabuti, um, It is thus, Sabuti, that someone who has set out in the Bodhisattva vehicle should know all dharmas, view them, be intent on them. So he should know all teachings, dharmas. And he should know and view and be intent on them in such a way that he does not set up the perception of a dharma. I don't know, we should be able to talk about all dharmas without setting up our own dharma, our own teaching. Why? Well, because the perception of a dharma, the perception of a dharma, there's no perception. You can't perceive this. It can't be an object of perception. Because perception requires the threefold partition, doesn't it? You can't perceive it. What does perceive mean? An activity? Perceive? Perception, the act of perceiving? Can you have perception without something doing it? Cat or a mouse? Can you have this stuff called perceiving without something being perceived? Again, one, two, three, right? Knowing, knower, object known. So therefore, you can't perceive this. So what are you struggling to try to perceive it? You know, there's nothing to perceive. There's nothing to know. Can't know it, thank goodness. Right? There's no teaching, thank goodness, right? This is going to be ruinous, of course, when the collection plate goes around. You've got nothing to say, no one to save. Right. And then we can walk away with a smile. Right. Well, so the great, this is a great quote, I think. It's one of my favorite quotes. So now Sabuti is the disciple, you know, the Buddha, and he comes over to the Buddha and he says, okay, now how am I going to talk about it? How am I going to illuminate this, you know? So, it, the language isn't smooth, so go along with me on this, and I'll try to make it clearer later. But I do want to read it. And finally, Sabuti, says the Buddha, if a bodhisattva, a great being, had filled the world systems, immeasurable and incalculable, with seven precious things, gave them as a gift to the Takthagatas, the Arhats, and the fully enlightened ones. And if, on the other hand, a son or a daughter of a good family had taken from this Prajna Paramita, which is, this is called Prajna Paramita, Prajna, the way of seeing, Paramita, the perfection of seeing, the, the perfection of Prajna, Prajna Paramita, had taken from this Prajna Paramita, this discourse on, on, on the Dharma, but but just one stanza of four lines, and we're to bear it in mind and demonstrate and recite it and study and illuminate it in full detail for others, on the strength of that, this latter would beget a greater heap of merit, immeasurable and incalculable. And how would he illuminate it? So as not to re reveal it. Therefore, it said he would illuminate it. 
so as not to illuminate it. Well, then, what is everything? You know, I mean, okay, now what can you say? So here's a great line. Right? Uh, but just to go back into that, to make sure you see it, that uh, of all of these great beings, Takathagata, Arahats, fully enlightened ones, no matter how much merit they accumulate, that's not even comparable to just a son or a daughter from a good family taking any four lines of the Diamond Sutra and stating it and reciting it and explaining it and expound upon it. That person's merit is much greater than all of these other people. Because they would gain a greater heap of merit, immeasurable, incalculable, than all of the Buddhists and all of the enlightened people. So how will he illuminate it? So as not to reveal it. So if you don't reveal it, you know what? That's illuminating it. There's nothing to reveal, is there? Is there anything to reveal? There's nothing there to reveal. Well, that's the way to illuminate it. Therefore, what is, what is all this? Uh, I'm going to, this is a commentary to the line I'm going to read now. When we have realized what conditioned things really are, we'll take no more delight in them and we'll become increasingly purified becoming more and more independent of them, and finally cease to rely on them. And that is nirvana and emptiness. Now this is, this is not the Diamond Sutra, this is his commentary, Edward Kamsi. Kumara Jiva's translation makes this connection clear by adding, and this is the quote I wanted to add, When he does not seize upon signs, such, suchness remains unmoved. Here's the quote now. <clears throat> as stars, as a fault of vision, as a lamp, as a mock show, dewdrops, or a bubble, a dream, a lightning flash, cloud, so should one view what is conditioned. What is conditioned is all the things you can make statements about, because any statement you make about is a supported thought. So no matter what you say about the phenomenal world, all of those things are saying, take all of that phenomenal world, everything in our experience, it's like stars. <laughs> It's like a fault of vision. It's like a lamp, a mock show, dew drops, a bubble, a dream, a lightning flash, a cloud, and so one should view all things in that respect. Now, this was added. See, this was added in the Buddhist tradition much later. And so I thought I'd end this by saying, do we need that? Do we have to depreciate everything because we can say something profound about that by not saying anything about it, but by indicating it? See, there's this tendency to deny everything if there is something that we exalt. And you see, that's this opening quote I put up here, remember? The absolute exalts holy person. If we exalt this state of mind, that's considered to be the bodhisattva state of mind, of pure consciousness, do we have to depreciate everything else? Well, that's what Kumara Jiva added to the text. But if you don't, see, the, the, uh, it's a question of how you translate a couple of Sanskrit words in, in Chinese. Um, 
When I was working with Nyobang, we were talking, and we came up with this as a much better translation. That whatever, whatever that is, the absolute, it naturally brings forth those that can sooner or later return and realize that there wasn't any journey at all. <laughs> right? So I thought I'd leave it at that and uh, thank you for attending. It's my old favorite sutra from Myobang days. And if Myobang, Myobang ever comes into town, I would advise many people to go see him. He's a very, very fine, insightful, very insightful Zen master. Ah, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you.